When I was in high school, I had a massive crush on a boy. He was a year older than me. He was also on the basketball team, which meant <clears throat> excuse me, that he was in one of those popular groups that I mentioned last Sunday when we were talking about giving up popularity. Well, he was also very good looking and quite charming. And he sang in the choir with me. But try as I might to start a relationship with him, he wasn't interested in that. But we ultimately became very, very good friends. And to this day, we are still very good friends. The year he graduated, which was the year before I graduated, he wrote a lengthy entry in my yearbook, and he closed it with the following quote, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You see, in addition to being tall, charming, and very good looking, my friend was also a very strong Christian. And our friendship has survived because of that common bond. And that quote that he wrote in my yearbook many, many years ago comes from John's Gospel in chapter 15, verse 13. It's a part of Jesus' farewell discourse, which spans over several chapters in the Gospel of John. And that quote has stayed with me since 1975 when he wrote it in my yearbook. And to this day, it is one of my favorite Bible verses of all time. I wonder, have you ever experienced a love like that? A love that is so great and so strong that you would be willing to give up your life for that person? I know I feel that way about my family, and I'm sure there are many of you here who also feel that way about yours. It's a love so strong and so deep that you would give up anything and everything if it meant that that other person would prosper and live. Do you feel that way? Or have you felt that way about someone in your life? Do you feel that way about someone right now? Well, if you do, then you know what Jesus meant when he said, greater love has no one than this, but to lay down one's life for his friends. And you know why Jesus did what he did on the cross for you and for me, for everyone. Today we are ending a sermon series that we were, were uh, a journey through Lent called Giving It Up. And during that sermon series we've talked about the things that God wants us to give up. Things that cause damage to our relationship with God as well as our relationship with other people. And as we've considered the ways that we can give up control or give up expectations or give up superiority or even popularity, I think we've come to realize that giving up any of these things, much less all of them, is hard work, isn't it? It's not easy to give up those things that have become such a big part of our lives. But then again, what Jesus did for us wasn't easy either, was it? He was betrayed by one of his friends. He suffered unimaginable torture. He was nailed to a cross, naked and bleeding. And he died an excruciatingly painful death. Why? Because no greater love is there than this than one lay down his life for his friends. Now, if any of you have been to seminary, or if you've taken a religious studies class, or a class on theology, you have probably heard about the atonement. It's a doctrine that we as Christians look to to help explain why Jesus gave himself up 
on the cross. It, it's a way that we figure out how we can become at one or reconciled to God because of the work of Jesus Christ. Now, I see your eyes are starting to glaze over, so please relax. I'm not going to launch into a theological lecture here. Um, but I am going to give you just a little bit of background so that we can maybe consider an alternative to the traditional theories or doctrines of atonement. The first, but first I will tell you that there are a number of theories that date back centuries and are centuries old, but there really are only three that people are consider major theories on the atonement. First, there's the ransom theory, which basically says that in order for our sin to be removed, that someone has to pay the ransom, and that Jesus paid that through his death. In other words, Jesus paid off our debt. There's also the moral influence theory, which says that the purpose of Jesus' life was to bring positive moral change, and that most of that happened through his teachings and through his example, but that the true catalyst was his martyrdom on the cross and his resurrection. Then there's the satisfaction theory, which later became refined into what's called the penal substitution theory, Yes, David, I did bring it up. <laughs> Which says that Jesus suffered crucifixion in our place. That, in other words, he was the substitute for us. And he took our punishment for our sin. In other words, Jesus was kind of like our scapegoat. He went to the cross and he took our sins upon himself. Now, that's just, that's like a whole year's worth of the theology in a nutshell. And all of these theories have their good and their bad. And one of them might be the one that you have accepted as your understanding of why Jesus did what he did. But there's another way that I would like you to consider the atonement. And just think about it, maybe chew on it this week. It's one that actually was recently brought to my attention through, of all things, Facebook. <laughs> and here's what it says. You see, when Jesus talks about sin in the Gospels, he's not just talking about breaking certain rules. Jesus is talking about how when we sin, we miss the mark of perception, of perfection. And within that context, sin can be anything that separates us from the love of God. The, and love is, of course, the cornerstone of Jesus' message. So much of what Jesus taught his disciples had to do with love. Loving each other. Loving our neighbors. Loving our enemies. Even loving ourselves. And those teachings were based upon the fullness of the law, the law that says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our strength and all our mind and with all of our soul. Jesus taught us that in no uncertain terms that God is love. And if we truly believe that, then we also have to believe that whenever we do something that is uncaring or unloving, that we have sinned, that we have missed the mark. Which brings us then to the cross. You know, that day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, the day we call Palm Sunday, he knew what he was doing. He knew that when he went into those temple courts, that the actions that he took, when he turned over the tables of the money changers, and when he, he made, confronted the religious authorities and called them hypocrites, he knew what was going to happen. In fact, those actions alone were a sure ticket to the cross. He died on the cross because he offended the people who were in power. He died on the cross because he challenged the status quo. 
He died on the cross because love would not sit idly by while those who had so little were abused by those who had so much. Jesus died on the cross to show us what love in action looks like. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus came to dwell among us to show us what love really looks like. It looks like healing people who are hurting. It looks like feeding people who are hungry. It looks like loving people who are unlovable by human terms. It looks like comforting those who are grieving. It looks like helping the lost find meaning in life through a relationship with Jesus Christ and Christ's followers. That's us, my friends. Love led Jesus to, the, to death on the cross. Love for the stranger, the afflicted, and the poor. Love for his brothers, his sisters, and for us. And love caused Jesus to be raised from the dead because God so loved the world that God could not and would not let death have the last word. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are the only evidence we need of God's love for us. And because Jesus lived and died and now lives again, we too have hope for a better life. We are given new hope for life that lasts forever. And we are given new hope of a love that never ends. So, as we move into a new phase of our lives, as Easter people who have given it up, as we give up control and expectations and enemies, as we give up superiority and popularity and even our lives, let us also give up death. Because we don't have to be afraid of death. Because death has lost its sting. Jesus has given us the victory. Because greater love has no one than this, but that one lay down his life for his friends.